grade 12 IEB IT theory. This is module 1.1 and it's all about hardware. First we're going to talk about a few the different kinds of computing devices that are available. So under mobile technologies we have laptops and netbooks, although netbooks are mostly outdated now. Um, the advantages of these small devices, laptops, is that you have a powerful CPU, there's a full-scale operating system, and it is expandable. The disadvantages are its size. Sometimes the screen is a bit small and um, the keyboard is restricted. The battery life is short compared to a smartphone, although it's getting better. Um, but it typically lasts 6 to 10 hours. It's not always on. You know yourself, if you switch off your laptop, it takes a few minutes to boot up. And there is typically no built-in cellular, cellular data. You have to buy a dongle if you want to use um, internet with, uh, when there's no Wi-Fi. Smartphones are actually a complete computer, a little mobile computer with a complete operating system. They have the size and the shape of a cell phone and they can make calls, but they also do a whole lot of other computing functions. The advantages are they are always on. It is what we call a convergence device. This is an important buzzword, the convergence, meaning that it combines the abilities of many devices into one. So like your smartphone has a GPS, you can use it to make calls, you can use it to search on the internet, you can use it even to type out documents and so on. It's small, which is convenient, and it has a lot of built-in sensors. The disadvantages are that the mobile operating system can be restricted. You can't do everything on it that you can do on your computer. Input can be difficult because it's such a small keyboard and it's not easily expandable. Tablets are the in-between. They have the same technology as smartphones, but they cannot make phone calls. The advantage is that their screen is bigger than a smartphone and they have a longer battery life than laptops and sometimes you can add a keyboard to some tablets. The disadvantage again, um, the mobile operating system which is limited in functionality. Windows tablets have a, the full Windows operating system and they're more like laptops. The e-reader is maybe lost popularity because people prefer a tablet which has more functionality so e-readers are made just to read electronic books you get dedicated e-readers like the Kobo, the Kindle, the Nook and um, some tablets, some, some um, e-books or e-readers allow multimedia to be used on them the advantages are they're cheaper than tablets and smartphones they're smaller and lighter they have a very long battery life, typically weeks, and you can actually easy, more easily read the screen in sunlight. The dis disadvantage is that it's a single purpose device, so that's really made for people who read a lot. The advantages of mobility is convenience, because with a mobile device you can carry fewer items. You don't need separate items to do everything you want to do. It combines functions in new creative ways. You're not restricted by time or location and you can be more, pro more productive. The future of computing lies in always on powerful convergent mobile technologies. So some of the constraints, the battery life is a big constraint. Um, there are lots of sensors, you have network connections, you've got a more powerful CPU, and all of these need more battery life. So the average with a smartphone is 10 to 24 hours, a tablet 6 to 10, a laptop 3 to 10. And because you've got limited battery life, it means some people carry extra batteries, or they have to carry their charger with. They might not get through the day with their laptop, and they have to make choices or else limit their use of their, of their device. And there's a trade-off between computer power and consumption. The more powerful a device is, the more it will consume. Speed and availability of communication is another constraint. Cell phone reception is very important, and some places may only have edge available 
they do not have 3G or more advanced LTE um, network capabilities. And people get very frustrated because the internet is so slow in those places. Um, size is important. The device must be small and light. But on the other hand, when it's too small, it loses functionality. Um, small and light limits computing components and batteries as well. If you want your device to be smaller, the battery has to be smaller and then it might not last as long. We're going to look at a lot of factors that influence the performance of the computer. You cannot say there's one single thing that will affect it. And it's important to understand how each different component affects the performance of the computer. But generally, the more expensive components are, the faster they will help your computer to work. The CPU is a very important component. It's the brain of the computer and does most of the work. Its speed is measured in gigahertz, and higher speed means more instructions are executed per second. The number of cores is important. The more cores you have, the better it will work, and it will work better, especially when you do multitasking. So a very important factor is overclocking. Some people like to speed up their CPU and um, make it work faster than what it's um, designed for or specified for. And some people even um, overclock their whole system, so the whole motherboard is made to work faster than it's supposed to. This obviously does improve the performance of the computer. It works much better and faster, but things can overheat. And these people tend to have to invest a lot into cooling their computers. You can see in the picture, there's a water cooling system. Some people go into great trouble to cool their computers so that they can make them overclock. And there's a danger that you burn your whole system or your CPU out when you do overclocking. Register size is another important factor. You've heard of 32-bit CPUs and 64-bit CPUs. This just means that the registers, which are little scribbling pads or blocks in the CPU, where um, the results of your calculations or data that is being worked with is stored temporarily while it's been worked on. So the, the bigger the register size, um, Typically, this will help with speed, especially when big bits of data are being worked on, although it depends on the type of process being handled, whether um, it will influence speed or not. Hyperthreading is a technology that is um, some, some CPUs have, where more than one thread, which is more than one part of a of a, of a software can be handled at the same time. So hyperthreading means that two threads are executed in parallel. It's almost like you have two, two processes, but it is not the same as multi-core processing. It does allow more work to be done by the processor during each clock cycle, especially when multi-thread applications are being processed. And to the operating system, a hyper-threading hyper microprocessor looks like it's two separate processes working together. Multiprocessing is when you have multiple CPUs on a single CPU chip, so like a quad core or a dual core, and it goes up to a lot of cores. <laughs> processes can run at the same time, but looking at multiple processes in isolation is not a good way of saying that your, perf your performance is faster. You have to take everything into account. Clock speed, register size, and multiprocessing. So it is complicated. Memory and cache. Memory is where your computer keeps instructions. So the more memory you have, the more instructions can be loaded from the hard disk drive at a time into memory. And this does improve performance. And it's probably the cheapest and simplest way to improve the performance of your computer. But also remember that if you have a 32-bit operating system, it can only address 4 gigabytes of RAM. You would need to change to a 64-bit operating system if you want to install more RAM on your computer. Cache memory. Well, more cache memory is better. 
Remember that cache memory is used to um, is used in the CPU or on the hard drive, and it will store the data that you're probably going to need next in the CPU or hard drive, so that it doesn't have to fetch it in the CPU. You don't have to fetch it from normal RAM, and with the hard drive, you don't have to fetch it from the actual disks because the cache memory in those devices is storing the data you needed. It can't be upgraded, but it does help with speed. Storage and network. Storage um, is your hard drive. If you have a hard drive that has a lower access time, this helps. Um, you can increase the speed of your computer by replacing the hard disk drive with a, an SSD, which is a solid state device, or you can even add a solid state drive. And SSDs are much faster, although they are more expensive and usually lower in, in capacity. Now, the network speed is important as well. It's measured in megabits per second or gigabits per second, and it's how fast data is transferred to or from your computer towards the network. Obviously, it's also important for performance. Um, the graphics card or the graphics um, yeah, um, CPU, GPU, does help to improve performance. Um, because remember, it takes some of the work away from the CPU, and so um, a more powerful graphics card is important for people who are power users. Uh, bus, the bus performance. If you have a higher bus speed, you will have better performance. And the bus speed is, remember that it talks about the speed at which data is moved between the CPU and the other components. So you have many buses in your computer, the front side bus, the AGP bus, the memory bus, many others. Um, and you can see that they are very important for transferring data between the, pro the components. So faster bus speed will help. Now we're going to talk about the different categories of users. Um, so if you want to tell somebody what type of computer they need to buy, you have to first find out what sort of user they are. So the, at the bottom, we get your our home and personal use um, users. They do a little bit of office tasks. Um, when we say office, we're talking about Word and Excel or Google Docs and Google Sheets and so on. They do their internet banking, email, browsing. They might Skype, look at photos. So they... They do a lot on their computer, but it's not, um, they don't need high power. In a small office home office, or we call that Soho, these people do a lot of counting or billing, they use databases, they want to do electronic document archiving, planning and scheduling, they would need a slightly more powerful device. They don't have time to waste. And the amount of data they're working with is higher. Then power users are at the top. They're your hardcore gamers, architects, engineers, video editing professionals, scientists, and so on. And they need more very powerful devices. Often they need a bigger screen because um, the work they're doing is far more graphics intensive and therefore more power intensive on the computer. So here's some tables. Um, I'm not going to go through all the detail, it is in the book, and um, just to show that all of these components, the CPU memory, hard disk, solid straight, state drive, DVD, the types of ports, your mouse, monitor, printer, external storage and scanner, all of these need to be de decided based on the type of user that you are working with.